Are you ready to understand hypercalcemia? Well, come along with me as we talk about the causes, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of this electrolyte imbalance. We'll talk about the role of calcium and all the important test topics you need to understand. So if you're ready, grab a drink and let's get started. So if we take the word hypercalcemia and we break it down, hyper means high, cal is the prefix for calcium, and emia means blood. So hypercalcemia, therefore, is a high blood calcium level. Normal blood calcium is a range between 9 and 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So hypercalcemia, therefore, is a blood calcium level greater than 10.5. So 99% of body calcium is stored in the bone, and this is what helps make our bones strong. And it's probably also why our parents told us to drink milk if we wanted strong bones. Calcium is also really important for blood clotting. Calcium is required for all but two steps in the coagulation cascade. And fun fact, if you were able to take all the calcium out of a blood sample, it would not clot in the test tube. Within the cell, calcium entering the cytoplasm causes contraction of muscle fibers. Remember that action potentials in muscles cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And calcium then binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way, so actin and myosin can meet and cause muscle contraction. So calcium equals muscle contraction. Calcium power, baby! Plasma calcium levels also affect the excitability of neurons. Calcium acts like a sodium channel blocker. When we have high calcium, calcium sits in front of the sodium channels and will not let sodium flow into the cell. You're not coming in here. And the flow of sodium into a cell is responsible for action potentials. When calcium levels are normal, Sometimes calcium is sitting in front of the sodium channel, and sometimes it's not. So sodium will flow into the cell at a controlled rate. And this will lead to controlled muscle contraction. But when calcium levels are really high, it's very easy for all that excess calcium to sit in front of the sodium channel. This will prevent sodium from flowing into the cell, which means cells will not depolarize. And if cells don't depolarize with the stimulus, then that causes muscle weakness. I'm just so weak. So calcium enters the body through the GI tract and is absorbed through the intestines. In order for calcium to be absorbed, however, vitamin D must be present. After calcium is absorbed, it is stored in the bones or excreted by the kidneys. So the parathyroid glands are little endocrine glands located on the back of the thyroid. And the primary purpose of the parathyroid gland is to secrete parathyroid hormone. And the primary purpose of parathyroid hormone is to increase calcium levels in the blood. So first, parathyroid hormone will go to the bone and take calcium out of the bone. That way it can go to our blood and increase blood calcium levels. Second, parathyroid hormone tells the kidneys to increase the reabsorption of calcium. And third, it also tells the kidneys to make the active form of vitamin D, which we know is important in the reabsorption of calcium from the gastrointestinal tract. So parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium levels. And a little memory trick for this is parathyroid hormone voids the bone of calcium. And the last thing I want to mention as far as body regulation of calcium is the fact that calcium and phosphate are opposites. When phosphate is high, calcium is low and vice versa. Now that we understand the major players in the game of calcium homeostasis, let's talk about the causes of hypercalcemia. And to help you remember the causes, I came up with a mnemonic. 
and I don't come up with lots of mnemonics, so if you'd rather me break down the causes like I have in previous videos, then just comment down below. But here it goes. High calcium is gravely dangerous in excess. And each of the first letters of each of these words correspond with a cause of hypercalcemia. So high corresponds with hyperparathyroidism. And this actually accounts for about two thirds of hypercalcemia cases. And it's caused by the mechanisms that we talked about before. Too much parathyroid causes calcium release from the bones and increases calcium absorption by the kidneys and by the intestines. Calcium corresponds to cancer. The other one third of causes of hypercalcemia are almost always the result of malignancy or cancer. And this is because tumors can cause bone destruction. When bones get destroyed, all that extra calcium flows into the blood. Is corresponds with immobility. When patients don't move, they don't stimulate osteoblast activity, which means they don't build their bones up. So bones get weak and calcium gets lost from them. Then calcium goes to the bloodstream and causes hypercalcemia. Gravely corresponds to glucocorticoids. Piggybacking on the previous mechanism, glucocorticoids in excess break down bone and cause calcium release into the bloodstream. Dangerous corresponds with diuretics and kidney disease. With kidney disease, we cannot filter and excrete electrolytes properly and calcium is one of these electrolytes. Anthiazide diuretics actually increase the reabsorption of calcium in the nephron in exchange for another electrolyte. In corresponds with increased oral calcium intake, and I feel like this one is pretty self-explanatory. And then excess corresponds with excessive vitamin D intake. Vitamin D increases gastrointestinal absorption of calcium. So an increase of vitamin D means that we will absorb more calcium and then we can get hypercalcemia. So the symptoms of hypercalcemia have to do with the role of calcium in action potentials and muscle function. And to remember the signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia, I tell myself that high calcium makes you sleepy. When you want to go to sleep at night, what do you drink? A glass of warm milk. And milk has calcium in it, and it will make you sleepy, and it will also make your muscles sleepy. In the musculoskeletal system, hypercalcemia causes muscle weakness and diminished deep tendon reflexes. When calcium levels are high, Calcium blocks sodium channels and will not let sodium into the cell to cause a depolarization and an action potential. And this will manifest as muscle weakness. In the respiratory system, muscle weakness of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles leads to respiratory insufficiency and hypoventilation. In the gastrointestinal tract, weakness of the smooth muscles in the intestines leads to decreased motility and hypoactive bowel sounds. And as the intestines move slowly, things get backed up and that can lead to constipation and abdominal distension, which will eventually cause nausea and possibly vomiting. In the neurologic system, calcium blockade of sodium channels will lead to diminished action potentials. And because the nervous system depends upon action potentials to communicate with each other, hypercalcemia can cause things like disorientation, cognitive impairment, and lethargy. So in the cardiovascular system, hypercalcemia can lead to a shortened ST and QT segment and actually cause tachycardia at first. And here's the pathophysiology of why. So remember the cardiac action potential. At the top of depolarization, calcium channels open and calcium flows into the cell over the plateau phase. And how fast calcium flows into the cell determines how long the plateau phase is. Normally, calcium will flow into the cell at a controlled rate. But in hypercalcemia, we have all this extra calcium outside the cell. 
so it can easily flow down its concentration gradient, which is now steeper into the cell. And it will flow into the cell at a quicker rate. So this will shorten the plateau phase. And since the plateau phase is the beginning of repolarization, this shortens repolarization. And on an EKG, the T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles. So if we shorten repolarization, then the T wave will come up quicker on the EKG. And this manifests as ST segment and QT interval shortening. So for the diagnosis of hypercalcemia, draw a metabolic panel and see that the serum calcium level is greater than 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Also, you'll want to complete an EKG and see the shortened ST and QT segments. So for the treatment of hypercalcemia, you'll want to restrict calcium intake and even discontinue vitamin D supplements if that's the problem. And another treatment is actually giving loop diuretics like Lasix to increase the urinary excretion of calcium. But here you'll want to supplement fluid loss with normal saline or have the patient drink at least 3000 milliliters of fluid a day to decrease the chance that the patient will end up with a kidney stone. And when you do this, you'll want to monitor your patient for flank pain, which can indicate the development of a stone. And then biophosphonates and other medications like calcitonin and phosphorus can be given. And these medications inhibit osteoclast activity. And remember from Fizz that osteoclasts were those cells that broke down the bone to increase blood calcium levels. So if we're inhibiting these cells, then we are decreasing our blood calcium levels because we're not breaking down the bone anymore. Hey guys, thanks for watching to the end. Comment down below with any questions you may have and be sure to share this video with a friend. Tap the like button if you learned at least one new thing from this lecture and don't forget to subscribe for more medical videos. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you guys next week.